This video is part of the Missouri Scholars Academy 2021 Comics, Culture, and the World video series. An interview with Jeremy Tarney, Ultimate Comics Live Show, June 9th, 2021. I am Jeremy Tarney. I am the host, or at least one of them, of the Ultimate Comics Live Show, which is uh, how you found me. I'm also the Chief Financial Officer of Ultimate Comics in Raleigh, Durham, and Cary, North Carolina. I have in some form or fashion been involved in comics retailing for over half my life now, uh, nearly 18 years. What was the comic shop like when the 2020 pandemic hit? I I think it's really easy to forget because it's been so long and such a big part of everything now. Uh, how quick it sort of came on. I was actually on a business trip in New York City in February of 2020 uh, for Toy Fair, you know, New York Toy Fair, seeing all the new releases, talking to all of the toy manufacturers, setting up new accounts and getting uh, special things for that. And, you know, in less than a month, we went from, you know, air travel, we went from staying in a hotel, we went from being at a convention in New York City, everybody talking about uh, all of the close calls we've had with pandemics in the past, you know, swine flu, bird flu, uh, just sort of everything. It, I, I think for a lot of people for a really long time, there was just a really strong belief that like a lot of these other things, it was going to blow over. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, the CDC started coming in and imposing restrictions really for the first time that I can remember in my entire life, you know, seriously starting to uh, pull back. And, and it seemed like every single week, there was something new. So as a, as a business, obviously our first priority is safety. I mean, just from a cold hearted business standpoint, if there's nobody to sell things to, you've got a pretty bad business. Uh, but realistically, we are all people uh, and especially in a specialty business, like we run, you know, the, the people that we see every week and, and week out coming to buy their regular comics, are, uh, you know, a pretty small subculture that we're all really proud to be a part of and very much so concerned about. Uh, so as soon as these things started coming down, uh, we started, uh, we set up hand washing stations at the front of the store. Uh, as soon as sort of masking sort of got, got around, we started toying with the idea of, uh, you know, how we were going to require what people to wear masks. We started asking people to engage in social distancing. We started, uh, you know, putting limits on the number of people in the store at a time. For the most part, most of those measures, even early on, were relatively well received because, again, I think the majority of people in our very specific corner of the of the community kind of understand that, uh, you know, we, we always want to do what's best for the most people. Um, but it was not very long after a lot of those suggestions became kind of codified. Uh, and we just had to shut down the store, um, which uh, I think feel like even even again looking back on it it seems like such a necessary action um but it 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 honestly just came on so quickly that it you know while we were still talking about the things that we could do to make things safe uh it just ended so uh very quickly had to sh shift gears to what can we do with the stores not actually being open <laughs> So did you guys have these live auctions on Facebook uh, before the pandemic or was this as a result? Very coincidentally, we just started doing them in January of 2020. Uh, a friend of ours in Florida who has uh, his own live show had been doing it for a while 
but is just not nearly as big of an operation as us, doesn't have nearly the uh, collection of sort of vintage books that we have to go through, and was just sort of talking about how we would be such a good fit for it because we have so much inventory, because we have some good personalities. Uh, a lot of the people that had been doing it previously, they're sort of two categories of uh, comic people. They're sort of newer comic book people who might be a little bit younger, a little bit more energetic, might uh, be a little bit more able to connect with an audience. However, for their way to have a huge section of uh, kind of quality inventory to go through for a live show, you know, it's either gonna be just a lot of newer stuff or uh, just less stuff in general mm -hmm. and then vice versa on that you have a lot of old guys who have been uh, collecting for years and years and years these retailers that just have warehouses full of stuff and they just are wholly content to sit behind a counter you know seven days a week and not really interact with the public that much uh, and we have luckily been able to build our business as a pretty decent cross-section of the two uh, where, you know, we're just kind of always striving to do what's best and be engaging while at the same time at this point, you know, have been in business for so long and have uh, had vintage comics, especially as a real cornerstone of our business. It's something that I personally have always uh, been a really big fan of. Uh, so it's sort of always held as our business has grown and changed and, and gone into a lot of different markets that weren't nearly as profitable or uh, prolific as they were when I started comics retailing, uh, you know, but we've been able to kind of keep all of the other facets as, a, as well. So uh, yeah, long, long story short, we had a couple of months to establish our live shows uh, before the pandemic hit. And it really helped us in terms of, uh, I mean, just figuring out technically how it worked, figuring out, you know, what the rhythm was going to be for it, figuring out which things people were kind of looking for, figuring out how to get a good mix of product. So by the time we got to March and April, when everybody was sitting at home looking for things to do and people that had grown accustomed to going to the comic book store every single week or more often uh, and were all of a sudden unable to, we were ready to go. It was, it was, it was almost like the perfect you know, preseason and then we were ready for, uh, for the first game, ready to go. When you started the live auctions, what were some initial setbacks? To be completely honest, my first biggest apprehension was that nobody in the world wanted to stand there for two hours and just watch me talk about comic books. It just was unfathomable to me. Uh, and then we very quickly uh, realized that people were enjoying it. We had to bump the runtime to three hours. We <laughs> had to expand to two shows a week and then three shows a week and occasionally squeeze in a fourth show a week uh when we were sort of at the height of the pandemic uh honestly the biggest challenge especially up front was whenever you're working in any small business i presume but especially a small business like this that is definitely a passion for a lot of people it is absolutely a uh a hobbyist's occupation for for most people they're very few individuals that have gotten excessively wealthy retailing comic books. Mm -hmm. Even before we started doing the live show, there was a ton of work to do. Just constantly, every moment of every day, maxing out every uh, opportunity to get something done. And there's still 
a mountain of projects that need to get worked on. Uh, so figuring out how to fit in, not just, uh, you know, I mentioned at, at first we were doing one show a week, it was just two hours, and I had a co-host doing it with me. Um, the live show is so much more than just those two hours because I have to dig through all of the, uh, you know, inventory. I have to pull things out that I specifically, you know, know about, want to sell, uh, and think somebody else would want to buy. Then I have to, you know, grade every single one of those comics, come up with a condition on it. Then I have to look up the value on every single one of those comics. Uh, and then I have to sort of organize them for the show so that uh, it's, you know, you, you can't just sit there and run 40 $200 books in a row because that's beyond most people's budgets and you kind of burn out anybody that is there uh, to, to buy $5 books. Likewise, you can't just have a huge string of $5 books because then we're not making enough money to make make it a worthwhile endeavor. And again, there are people that are on watching to buy more collectible books. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of those little things, even at first, even for, you know, one two hour show, you know, you work 40 hours in a week, that's probably 10 hours from prep time to doing the show. And then after the show, uh, because it's all online, you know, you have to organize all the books who bought which thing you have to send invoices out to every single person you have to check the invoices because you don't want to send people books that they didn't pay for uh at the beginning of the show the majority of our people were in store pickups uh so even though the stores were closed uh well i guess they weren't closed yet right so we could just drop them off at the store whatever the, of our three locations people wanted to pick them up at uh, but still, you have to sort them out, send them off, and then anybody else you had to pack up, ship out. Uh, so that takes a lot of time. And I don't think that we were super prepared for how much extra time prepping for the show and uh, just sort of getting all of the stuff after the show would take. And it, even now, it is a constant struggle after doing this for a year and a half. We now have four hosts. It's mostly Sienna and I, but Harrison and Grace still pop in. Uh, we have Jen who works nearly full time just doing the recordings behind the computer. She does all the invoices and she does uh, some of the organization. We have Daniel Hotel with organization. We have uh, a different Zach and Brock do all of the shipping. Uh, and we just brought in Andrew to help. Uh, so, I, I mean, we have almost an, an, an entire crew of people, of all full-time employees that are doing almost exclusively the live show right now for us to do three three hour long shows every week uh so how has technology or social media impacted comics culture so it's actually i really loved this question because it's really obvious with something like the live show that we host on facebook uh we started doing it on facebook it is largely a product of facebook redesigning their algorithms a couple years ago to make live video their primary focus. Uh, and it's something that we've been able to take advantage of. But even before that, it was our primary advertising venue. It's just so quickly taken over traditional advertising. Uh, e even myself as a millennial, you know, I don't have a cable or satellite service. I just have a bunch of streaming options, most of which don't have advertisements on them. Uh, and, and I think I've convinced a lot of Gen Xers and boomers to do so as well. I would presume that a lot of your students and Gen Z uh, uh, are probably in that group where they, they just, you know, cable TV, newspaper, magazine, advertising just aren't feasible anymore uh and just realistically you're not 
having access to uh, your audience, but in an it, incredibly larger point, which I think is really probably overlooked by, by most people is how much social media has been able to allow people who have interests that aren't necessarily uh, as popular within their small community to find other people with those same interests. Uh, I, I'm sure that you remember all the way back in 1998, 1999, when they first announced they were going to make a live action X-Men movie. I lost my mind uh, at the prospect that they would even attempt such a thing. Uh, and obviously it was a huge commercial success. Uh, but going into it, it was very much so a, a much smaller thing than superhero movies have become. And uh, obviously coming off the heels of that, you got Spider-Man, which was huge. And then that led to Iron Man and the rest of the MCU and sort of comic book movies as we know them now. Uh, but I, I mean, just when I was in high school, Everybody had seen Star Wars, but I was the only person that loved Star Wars. Well, I'm not going to say only person. There's a small group of people that loved Star Wars. A lot of people, you know, had seen the old Batman movie or the old Superman movie, but uh, I was about the only one in my high school that pretty dedicatedly read comic books, uh, you know, new books that were coming out at the time. And I think uh, once I stepped into that world, once I got into being able to read kind of, you know, monthly and weekly comic books, it sort of opened up a lot of my own personal interests because I just had a community of people to share them with all of a sudden. Uh, it's really easy to find a lot of fans of football. Um, which I'm a fan of as well, I'm a huge football fan, um, was something that was really easy to share with a lot of other people in high school. I was always the nerdiest kid in the room. Uh, I think with social media, even if you're the nerdiest kid in the room, there is a way bigger room for you to step into and way more people in it that are on that same level with you. And I think knowing that you're not alone in it, and I think uh, showing that you can express yourself without fear of being made fun of, without being abnormal in any way, has led to a lot of uh, just this ridiculously positive upward trend that I feel like we've been seeing, uh, especially uh, since I think through my adulthood with kind of every generation that we've had that's younger than me, has been a little bit more forgiving and a little bit nicer, a little bit more accepting. And I think that social media just plays a huge part in that because it gives people the opportunity to be themselves a little bit more. And I think it gives people the opportunity to kind of see more of the world. What recent changes have you seen in comics culture? So again, I'm going to go back relatively recent uh and it's kind of crazy i was actually just thinking about it this morning superman was first created in 1938 which from a you know historical standpoint is still relatively recent um but the silver age of comics really kicks off in 1961 with fantastic four number one that's just over 20 years where you get from the first ever superhero created to it being just the absolute dominant form of the medium uh, and be kind of resulting from that silver age, you get the explosion of superheroes in popular culture. You get the Batman TV show, you get the Spider-Man cartoon, you get, you know, uh, Superman on lunch boxes, Halloween costumes. It, it just is everywhere. Uh, so when I first started working for Ultimate Comics way back when ago when I was in high school. I, I just mentioned that it was a lot less popular to show your appreciation for 
comic books, comic book related properties, general sci-fi things that are considered geeky or nerdy. Uh, I think with how much some of these stories have picked up in the uh, the popular culture has just been enormous. And I think it started with the movies uh, in terms of just kind of showing the merit that a lot of these stories and characters have. But I think that the format has been picking up a lot of legitimacy in that same time period, because all of a sudden, if you're a fan of Loki, you know, which has its very own show that just debuted today, right? You're not necessarily a, a dork or a nerd or a geek. You're just somebody who saw the single biggest movie that's ever come out, you know, and appreciating one of the uh, breakout hit characters from it. And wanting more of that isn't crazy or absurd or ridiculous. It's just another hobby at that point. So I think, again, you're sort of seeing people legitimizing even the, the mass appeal of it, while at the same time, you saw really starting in the 80s, a huge explosion of creator-owned material. Uh, obviously, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the biggest sort of example of a uh, self-published uh, smash hit independent book, but Image Comics founding in the early 90s with you know, uh, Todd McFarlane and Spawn, Jim Lee and Wildcats, just making it so that creators could do any kind of story that they wanted. It all just sort of kind of uh, snowballs and just builds and builds and builds until you get to sort of that early 2000s, uh, because that's when the Walking Dead comic book came out. That's when the Invincible comic came out. Uh, that is when you know, you start seeing this real shift where the stories coming out are sort of these fully developed, integrated concepts that aren't just made for more mature readers, but are made with kind of serious readers in mind. And you had a lot of those starting in the 80s with Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, uh, you know, stories like that. But those stories were sort of fewer and further between, right? They were special events, they were miniseries, they were uh, kind of these, these fringe books. Uh, even if they were hugely popular at the time, they, they weren't what was showing up in Batman. They weren't what was showing up in the X-Men. Whereas when Grant Morrison takes over the X-Men with uh, Frank Quietly after the X-Men movie came out, they were very specifically written with adult readers in mind, with complex stories and, uh, you know, really sort of adult emotions and patterns in them. What do you wish you were told about comics culture when you were a kid? Be entirely unrepentant about loving what you love. Uh, don't let anybody else tell you what you can and can't be a fan of. If you like My Little Pony, read the My Little Pony comic book. If you love Star Wars, read Star Wars. Uh, you don't have to follow trends, but if there's a billion people that enjoy the same thing, it might be worth taking a look at. Uh, if that's not your cup of tea, that's totally fine too. You don't need to feel bullied into you know liking something that is for other people. Uh, there's just such a astounding diversity of stories out there that I guarantee it's one that you're going to love uh, and just go out and find it. Please finish the sentence. If I were a superhero, I would want to be the absolute best that I could be. Uh, and I realize that that applies to a lot of things uh, that aren't specific to being a superhero, but I like to think the vast majority of heroes that we have got their powers by some quirk or accident. You know, they're just born with them or there's uh, some circumstances beyond their control. There's a handful that create themselves as a superhero, but even then they sort of uh, are guided into that. Even somebody like, you know, Dr. Strange only finds the, uh, you know, sor sorceress ways 
because his hands got mashed up. Iron Man only built a suit of armor because he had a heart condition and he was captured. Uh, so I think, you know, you got to make the best of your circumstances. And in anything that you do uh, is one of the lessons from my parents that has always stuck with me is any job worth doing is worth doing, right? Uh, and I like to believe that if I were a superhero, I would want to do everything in my power to figure out how to wield that the best um, and just be as effective and responsible and as uh, super as I could possibly be. Final comments. This is going to come from my just sort of personal experience as an old man that has been collecting for a long time. Uh, don't pass up on opportunities if you really think that you can make them happen. Um, from a collecting standpoint, you know, looking back on how many ridiculously good opportunities I've had that I thought would be too difficult to handle at the time. You know, I, I could have bought the entire original Star Wars series for $250. And rather than asking, uh, you know, a couple people for help with that, I just kind of sat back and said, I can't do it right now. Uh, you can't find a copy of issue number one by itself in a, in a lower grade for that much money anymore. Um, but obviously that applies to a lot of other things. You're not going to be 97 years old and wishing that you had spent more time sitting at home. You're not going to wish that you had, you know, spent less time with your friends. You're not going to wish that you had gone to fewer conventions. You're not going to wish that you had, uh, you know, not read that story that looked like it had a really cool cover on the shelf. Uh, so yeah, if there's something that fits, if there's something that you want to do, something that you want to buy, something that you want to collect, uh, uh, find a way to make it happen because life is about what you do and what you can do. Uh, and it's not about what you missed. Thank you to Jeremy Tarney and Ultimate Comics Live Show. You have been watching a video series from the Missouri Scholars Academy 2021, Comics, Culture, and the World. And as always, be safe, be smart.